he had like word for word written on slides and he would just read off the PowerPoint slides. I, I mean, and this man was the most monotone person you've ever heard in your life. And I didn't know that you could like fast forward stuff. Like Josh just showed that to me like a few months ago. I'm like, that you can go wow. Yeah. yeah. So I ended up like, I would pause the lecture slide and then I would like write down my notes and then I would, you know, go to the next one, pause it, and write. <laughs> does this thing on his slides so like you have to print off the slides and he has little blanks and you have to like just write it out that's how i do it yeah exactly how i do it i had a, I had a buddy that he's always called asleep and he'd be like i'm a fan of this more red writing like you know what, what'd you get on that red does the thing you gotta and then like the hardest thing i'm like no i'm not giving you a study guide guess where i'm pulling the questions from from the blanks that i told you to fill in <laughs> and i gave you a quiz it was based on the blanks that you filled in. So all you had to do is study the quizzes that are from the blanks that you filled in and whatever isn't on the quiz that you filled in, probably need to be studying that also. I mean, I literally just handed a softball back to my props class. So they were like, what is gonna be on it? What's the study guide? I'm like, it's in your hands. If we haven't gone over anything, it's going to be pretty much straight from the quiz. Wink, wink, and people are like, oh my God. I had no clue what I'm going to do. I don't know how this is going to go. This test, can we get, they were asking for a curve before it ever even started. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. There's a softball. All you had to do is study what was on the quiz. I told you exactly what was going to happen. So at that point, for those people who heard what I said with my eyes, they know to just go study everything that they had to fill in. Make note cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, even in lab quizzes, like I used to make those ridiculously easy. So we had an aspirin synthesis lab. Okay, it's aspirin, nothing big, whatever. So the other drugs I put on there would be like Claritin, Zoloft, aspirin. And you'd be surprised how many people thought they made Claritin. Yep. <laughs> no no doubt. No. All right. Can y'all see me out there in Teams? Can you hear me? Yep. All good. Yep. Uh, I can, can hear you. Can you see the screen? Yep. I am. I believe anyhow. All right, so I am back um, again. And so I kind of left off. We talked a little bit about uh, some conservation practices and then we've also talked about agronomy uh, and that kind of deals with you know fertility and making sure that we're um, efficient with our production practices so that we can kind of improve yield and um, as we move into kind of the application and kind of I'm, I'm, I'm almost giving a vision speech of what like I believe that my role as a researcher is going to be and then also some things that you might encounter down the road if you work in agriculture. And I know we have a couple of uh, people in well, West Tennessee, and so this is going to kind of be where you know y'all might run into someone that is in agriculture. He is working out in West Tennessee, and so this might be something uh, that he recognizes uh, quicker than y'all maybe. But try and tie all this together. So last time I kind of left out, um, I got a little. Uh, too deep into the machine learning models and, you know, kind of blockchain technology and what is blockchain and all this other stuff. Um, Dr. Ayers' eyes got really wide. She hadn't heard me talk about this in a moment uh, since summer, so um, I didn't want to get too much into NFTs, but I absolutely did bring them in. So this was my opportunity to kind of give my research uh, kind of where we would like to go in developing these decision support systems. Um, Steve Jobs has a lot of uh, great quotes that I like. I like listening to Steve Jobs and some of the things that he has to say in his ideology. Um, but ultimately, what he's saying here is that, you know, uh, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And so while we've mentioned that we have this gap between uh, the older generation of farmers and not understanding this new fancy thing, um, we are now showing them what it's going to be, whether they like it or not. <laughs> So this is going to be the thing in this new innovative technology. Um, and so precision agriculture is really kind of the, the culmination of all of the agronomic practices that we have. And uh, from this picture, you can see there are a lot of things going on. There is pivot irrigation, we have sprayers, we have yield, 
uh, for harvesting. We have uh, some land grading. We also have some sprayers. Uh, so we have all these things going on um, in our system. And you notice that there's a creek running through. And so what we're trying to do is minimize the impact to that creek. Also, something else you might notice is that there are two people down there that appear to be operating this whole entire system. And so that's what precision agriculture kind of allows us to do so we can do more with less. And so a few of the things that we do with precision ag um, are going to be like soil mapping, remote sensing, variable rate technology, and yield monitors. And all of this together. Uh, is gives us a pretty comprehensive picture of what our agriculture system kind of looks like. Uh, because there's so much that goes on between soil, we've got crops that are um, involved in that as well. You'll have to lay more. Fine. Um, one of the most important components of this is the weather station. Uh, I often wonder what they used to do back in the day when they only had a thermometer and a rain gauge. Uh, so now we can monitor wind speed, uh, relative humidity, things of that nature, uh, changes in temperature. And we're doing most of this from our phone, as I mentioned uh, previously, that ultimately we'll be able to manage greenhouses and green spaces from our phone uh, with these decision support systems. But it's gonna take an understanding of that um, field equipment and the sensors that are all linked together through GPS. And so without getting into like how are they linked up and what the satellites are, um, many of us are familiar with Google Maps. You can think of Google Maps as working very similar that it updates. I always hear people say we want to beat the, we want to beat Google Maps. Like you can't beat Google Maps. It updates as you're driving. It used to be back in the day we could do that. You could you could put it in like like when it first came out, it just knew that you were in Cookville and it took approximately 1.25 hours to get to Nashville at 60 miles an hour. None of us are driving 60 miles an hour on the way to Nashville, so we could beat the clock. Uh, today, we can't do that because the GPS uh, is so updated, updates in real time. So for this whole system, we have the data collection, uh, which is going to be, uh, again, that soils, our yield, some of the crop conditions like fertilizer, uh, irrigation, nutrients. We will put that into a computer system. So we're using these machine learning models, um, deep learning, in order to come up with some interpretation that gives us a decision. Again, I mentioned the decision is based on the producer. And so even if producers did want or adopted this new technology, there would always be this age old, I think I can beat Google Maps. And so the goal is to have the producer choose their way and then bring this system together and say, do you or do you not beat Google Maps? Air quotes, Google Maps being this precision agriculture kind of thing. And where do they actually win? Because no one knows their land better than them. Uh, so there will be this kind of shared experiment where you say you know how to farm better and I go, well, I've got technology on my side. You say no to this decision. Let's see how it goes. You think yes, I think no. Let's find out. And then we ultimately use that to, um, we apply that in the next year. So this is a continuous ongoing thing. Uh, it's not just a one-time deal where we can say this will happen every year because each year is different. So another kind of image to visualize this, we have the data collection, the analysis and the planning. We'll put that into the operation and then we'll measure the outcome. So did it work? Yes or no? How does this, how do, and if it didn't, what do we need to change in the data? What was wrong? So that's where the machine learning kind of comes in. Machine learning can run all those different scenarios and say, what if you applied 13 more pounds of fertilizer? If you got more rain, if you didn't get rain, what's it supposed to be like? And then ultimately we find out if it matters in our yield. So the adoption of precision agriculture, we can see that there have been some drastic increases since we have started developing this technology. 
uh, mostly just because we can do GPS mapping. There's a new cool thing now where there are autonomous tractors, where it's a robot driving itself, basically. Um, the problem that we might have with that is it getting hacked, right? So that's kind of the, what they're testing there is that someone doesn't hack that, someone doesn't hack that, you know, 16 ton tractor or whatever it is uh, with your, your combine um, and run it off into the creek or something, right? Or just scramble it or mess it up because then those are expensive. Uh, and then uh, for me is really going to be that soil mapping and the variable rate technology because soils are variable. That is the answer. When I cannot figure out why this thing happened, I just chalk it up to soil variability. And everyone goes, oh, that makes sense. So I'm almost like a weatherman. I don't even have to be right. I just have to say that the soil variability is messed up. So pay us. But the soil mapping and the variable rate technology is really going to be uh, where we maximize or op at least optimize our inputs and outputs. Again, Steve Jobs, I love Steve Jobs and especially this quote the most in that we did, it doesn't make any sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. Why did you hire me? I am not, I'm, I personally am not a robot. Y'all are not robots. You, you're in an upper division, uh, even more than upper division in a graduate level class are paying you to be the thinkers. What sense does it make to hire you and then say, do it this way? And you're bringing the newest and latest and greatest innovative ideas from Tennessee Tech University. So we hire smart people to tell us what to do. Unfortunately, the output of smart people is dwindling, uh, and so we have to find better ways. And so we're using robots to start to gather this information. Uh, we trust that they're always going to be working uh, and, until they don't. Uh, we don't have to worry about them on smoke breaks. We don't have to worry about them on their phone. Uh, we don't have to worry about the time. We can let them do everything by themselves. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, we have these smart tractors. Um, what's interesting is these texting cows. So I'll move this out of the way. I have an interesting story about these texting cows. In 2010, when I was an undergrad, uh, we had to do like a, um, we had to come up with a product that we needed to sell at like a trade show. And they had professors come around and was kind of like, you know, a board. And we stood there and gave a presentation, come check out our product. And it could be anything we wanted. And so at the time, I was like, you know, it would be really cool if we had like GPS ear tags that would like track the cattle and maybe kind of tell when they were sick or in estrus or whatever. Uh, and one of the kids in our group was, he was a, he was a cattleman. And he was like, producers are only going to buy stuff that's realistic. So sure enough, in 2017, I went to a field day in and at UT Knoxville, and sure enough, if my product wasn't on one of those cows, and I was so mad because I could have been rich back in 2017, I was like, there's my thing. So uh, with that story, I just want to let you know that if you can dream it up, be careful, it's probably coming. Uh, many of us have smartwatches where we can talk and text, and if you're old enough like me, you remember Inspector Gadget. And Penny had a smartwatch in like 1989. And now here we are. So, you know, back to the future, they had video phones where you could kind of talk to people. And now we had that in our pocket. So if you can dream it, go for it. Because, you know, we can do that type of thing. Uh, we have drones uh, and these agrobots that are now, you know, doing microdot applications. But what's most important is the person that is monitoring that if I can get my mouse there it is there we go this person so now we have one person that is responsible for all of these things and it used to be that you needed to be specialized we had one person that could work on the tractor there was one person that understood everything about the cows there's only one person that can fly the drone there's one person that knows about the fertilizer and they all report to a boss so well, now you are the boss and you need to know how to do all these things. So now it's a more generalized approach. Whereas before we were trying to be very specific because we realized that the more brains you have, two heads are better than one. Now we're trying to teach two, pe two people's worth of information for one person. So we're trying to multitask so that we can do more with less. Um, 
some of the different types of robots and drones and some of the things that we can do with those. I am a drone guy. Uh, that is my jam. And as I come to Tennessee Tech and to try to bring that technology here, that is kind of what my purpose is and my research mission as I move forward. Smart form technology is going to be the wave of the future. One person running one greenhouse and using robots and cameras in order to do that, uh, being able to run a, a, a greenhouse from their office. Uh, some people have this as far as like golf courses, the superintendent can turn heads on and off from their desk. Instead of having to drive all the way out there, turn the head on, drive around and wait, it can, we can do that now with the touch of a button. And so as our climates are changing, we're gonna be using greenhouses in order to monitor some of that. And then also to meet pr uh, productivity needs of a growing population and food security. Unfortunately, this runs on the Internet of Things, and some of you may or may not have heard of the Internet of Things, IOT, but it is the reason why you have smart houses. I, Internet of Things is the reason why you can turn your air conditioner on and off from your office or on the way home or raise the garage door from your phone or any of those type of applications. I believe that this is going to be a thing in response to this climate change resource conservation and enhancing efficiency. And so this is kind of where I've ended with uh, the lecture the last time that I was here. And so that we'll have all of these different components that will all be ran by one person. So it'll pretty much be a self-contained system in that you'll have your little section of land and you're the only one running it. And that's almost impossible to do if we don't have robots and we don't have technology in order to help that out. Some of the challenges to this are obviously going to be initial investment, like self-driving tractors are probably not cheap. Tractors that require a driver are not cheap, so you can only think about how much it would be for one that doesn't need someone at the wheel. Then, are you really going to let that tractor without someone in the wheel? Well, um, the technology is advancing. And we need to get that adopted by producers. And so I believe that this younger generation needs to be more um, trained in adopting the technology. They can always Google what they need as far as how come plants to perform photosynthesis. Like we didn't have Google back then. Now we have everything that we need at our fingertips, again, in the phone, if we could just get people to use them. And what I found in Tennessee is that while on a thousand acres out in West Tennessee, drones are an awesome thing because you can cover, you know, 450 acres in an hour. And so instead of driving a thousand acres, it takes you two and a half hours. You can have all the data that you need before lunchtime. So you fly the drone, you know, you, you go to the office, you fly the drone midday and you have your data uh, analyzed by the end of the day instead of having to drive around forever. We don't really have a thousand acres worth of crop production here in the Upper Cumberland. It was very difficult for me to even find a cornfield until like I went kind of south of I-40 going into Sparta and some of the uh, waterfalls. I was like, holy smokes, and it's windy road. And here I am trying to look at corn because I haven't seen it in like a year. And I'm almost running off the road because I'm looking and seeing the soybean and all this other stuff because I just don't notice that here. I just don't know how efficient it will be for a single producer to own a drone or to buy the services that a drone, uh, an ag drone provider would have. Unfortunately, uh, most of the majority of uh, the farm production is going to be in small and mid sized farms. So we have about 42% between small and mid size compared to about 44 percent so almost half or at least comparable uh, between small and mid-size versus the large scale so on a large scale basis flying drones make sense on a small scale basis probably not so much and then also to add to that what we have is like uh, these low input systems they're already economically distressed so it's not like they just have money they can go out and buy a drone and then spend all summer learning how to fly it and analyze the data they don't have internet. 
even though we claim that we have 5G coming, that's still spotty. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you have. Um, if you get south of, if you take 111 or you take South Jefferson south of I-40 going uh, kind of towards the DMV, you don't have reception. You just don't. Uh, one of the biggest issues is that we have crop heterogeneity. And so uh, in West Tennessee on a thousand acres, you plant it all to corn because it makes sense. Plant it all to soybean because it makes sense. As I mentioned before, we have hay. You might have soybean on the left, corn on the right, uh, and some cattle in the back and pasture and trying to grow all these different crops. Uh, so it wouldn't make sense to fly one mission for corn, one mission for soybean, one mission for um, hay. So we'd have to fly all of this and then analyze that data differently because corn looks different than soybean, soybean looks different than hay, all these different management systems. Producers are not technologically savvy. So here we are trying to tell them, hey, you need to do this in order to improve your efficiency. But when they go to do it, they are less efficient than the thing. So it kind of shoots, they, they can't really grasp their mind around that looks cool. I would like to implement that. I have zero clue how to spell drone. And I wouldn't even know how to work it even if I did. Like, if I hand people my drone controller and they're scared and they're like, oh my goodness, I don't even, I don't want to break it. And then what do I do with the data when, when it's done and how do I analyze that? And I'll just pay somebody. <laughs> but the person that's charging is also charging $150 an hour just to show up. And then it's X. X thousands of dollar, uh, and how much does that cost per acre? Is it actually economically feasible to do? And so ultimately, that data management is also another sticking point because we have weather, we've got plant data, we've got soil data, we've got water data. All of these sensors are you know, a sensor for everything to measure moisture and carbon and temperature and pH. Those cost money. Um, a weather station, even just a regular basic rain gauge is almost $500. I don't, I don't have $500 to just buy a, a something I can get with a bucket. I can technically measure how much rainfall I got with a bucket. Um, so something that I would like to propose is that we have these smart farms. There are some funding or some granting agency that we begin to implement this uh, Internet of Things smart farm technology on one farm. That data is then shared with a co-op. So let's take Livingston. Uh, they have a co-op up there. They have um, an agronomist and they have a precision agriculture program. Uh, and the farms that are around that or the production systems around that kind of they're the hub. Ag one co-op is the hub and the data goes in and we say, hey, we put this in. The co-op says you need this amount of fertilizer. So now we have this central hub of this co-op. We have these smart farms that are uh, sharing data back and forth with this co-op, and that's kind of anonymous. One of the problems that we have is the data anonymity because Farmer John doesn't want John Deere to know what they're doing because then now they're going to get a million calls from John Deere saying, hey, we saw what you did out there. We have a product that's better. Or we have a thing that we think you should use. And so now they're getting beat up with these emails and these phone calls about products they really don't want. So they would like to keep their information secure, and they would also like to gain the benefit of these de decision support systems. So what I propose is that we have these co-ops with these smart farms that are linked all across Tennessee, and the co-ops are linked. So we keep, the, we keep the producers out of the mix. They just, the data from the farms are put into some big database and at least have some identifier that doesn't necessarily put that out there, right? Like we don't want it to know that it's Dr. Ayers farm or Dr. Natchez's farm or Chris's farm. We just want it to know that it's farm one, farm two, farm three, farm four, take the GPS out so they don't really know what that is and just say when these practices happened, this was the yield increase. And so if we did this across Putnam County, as we started to do this in each county, that eventually the counties would be linked. And now we have the whole state link. And so when the weather in West Tennessee happens and production practices and management practices are implemented, they can say, hey, in, in two days, Cookville, you're gonna get this problem. Here's what we recommend you do. All right, cool, worked in Cookville. Hey, Knoxville, you're getting this in three hours. You need to 
do or don't do X, Y, or Z. And so, because I'm the drone guy, the way we're going to capture this data is with drones um, and these smart farm sensors. And so, uh, flying these drones across um, one farm. So, you know, we had this drone at Tennessee Tech. I had my own personal drone. I am probably going to go fly about 300 and some odd acres this weekend uh, just with my personal drone. And that's cool for one person, but the batteries on these drones last like 20 minutes. So I have five batteries because I'm going to fly 300 acres, and that's what it would take. So I'm going to get to that in a moment. I do believe this blockchain technology and the Web 3.0 is going to be the thing. Uh, for those of us that are old enough to remember when AOL first came out, it was life-changing. We are on the cusp of another dot-com boom. I believe. That's my personal opinion. I spent enough time watching it. I think that it's coming. So the way that we can accomplish this, uh, we're going to need to uh, educate our production managers, and I believe that there needs to be a shift in education uh, at the starting at the uh, elementary school level. Already struggle with math, so what's the point in teaching them math when we can teach them how to do the math or input that? You can do math with coding, picture identification. So uh, I, I, I call this color coding. So that instead of coloring with crayons, they're now coloring with code. We're behind on that. We're still playing with crayons. China's not. They are teaching coding now, by the way. They, and they need to be, right? Because that's going to be the future. And so if you know how to code, you got your ticket punched. If you don't know how to code, if I had time, I would learn to code over either my Christmas break or my summer break. Uh, but I have yet to find the time or make the time to sit down and learn a completely new science. So these unmanned aerial systems, uh, we call them UASs, uh, but you know, just for simplicity, we'll call them drones. It is going to be a growing business, and we can use these for a, um, a litany of different applications. I like the stand count, I like the pesticide applications, and also the fertilizer use efficiency, because these are uh, the chemical um, inputs or uh, losses to the environment. And some of the ways that we do this is going to be with a fixed wing. Uh, we saw the quadcopter earlier, uh, and then also this um, custom build, which I did when I first got into drones. Uh, it flew once because I'm not a drone builder. <laughs> I just buy it. Uh, but it was fun building it, right? Like I, I did enjoy learning how to do this. Um, I just don't understand how to program the flight controller. And again, I've got bigger things on my plate than trying to figure out how to make this toy that I built fly. I can just buy one for $1,500 and be done. But this fixed wing is going to be where we can cover more ground. So the battery life on that is probably 50 minutes. And it can probably cover five more, you know, five X more area than the quadcopter. Of course, with everything, some come with a benefit, some come with a drawback, and there are benefits and drawbacks to each. Fixed wing is definitely more difficult to fly, and it would need to be done by someone with uh, extra training. I would probably be okay handing my drone controller to Dr. Ayers or anybody else in this class and saying it it drives like a, like a PlayStation. It, it's a video game in motion for me, right? So when I tell it to go left, it goes left. When I tell it to go right, it goes right. Not so much with the fixed one. So it would have to be someone that is well trained to fly this and operate it. And of course, they're not going to pay someone just to go out there and play video games. They would also need to understand how to analyze that data. So we get more bang for our buck. There are uh, some sensors that we will use. Thermal cameras are going to be useful for, um, this would be useful for finding cattle in the middle of the night. Pop the drone up, go fly it, find it. There it is. It's, it's this one, one lone white dot underneath the tree. Uh, so you save a lot of time there. But we also use it to measure uh, photosynthesis and transpiration rates. Multispectral imaging is probably the most common one that we will use. Uh, hyperspectral imaging, uh, this is more along the provost level. This is more what she is familiar with. Dr. Bruce used to be at Mississippi State doing this work. Turns out we have that in common, 
and then LIDAR. And LIDAR is going to be very useful. Uh, we use this LIDAR for determining force. So you fly this LIDAR. Are you familiar with this? Some I haven't used it. You know, ever for force, you're right. So you basically, you can basically recreate a 3D model that you can walk through and it measures the trees. And you like, now you don't have to go out there and measure diameter or breast height. You can just fly a drone and let it do that. And it also knows the tree species. And so it'll determine the tree species and the density and all these things. And now we can start to do planning where we selectively cut out these trees. And rather than go out there and try and which tree this is, where are we at in this forest? It's all G, it's all geo reference, so you know exactly what tree. You get a list in your GPS thing and you just walk up Marco and you get to the tree very quickly. So now we're saving efficiency. I was having to find these things. We can we don't have to go out into the forest to like see this. We can do it from our computer. And pretty soon it'll be like Obi-Wan Kenobi where it'll just pop up on our desktop. I'm I'm not playing with that. <laughs> Um, in the metaverse video that I watched, they showed, um, this is Mark Zuckerberg was showing how you don't even have to leave your house in order to go to the office. And then this 3D model hologram showed up on the desk and everyone was working on it at completely different locations. So again, here we are 1977, Obi-Wan Kenobi and this hologram thing that was on the table and everyone thought that was so cool. And now that is actual reality now. So Make sure you watch the movies because that's the technology that's coming is what I've learned. Pretty soon we'll be time traveling. They can never get it figured out. But these sensors are going to be uh, instrumental in learning how to work them uh, will be beneficial for improving efficiency. Just a couple of common multi-spectral cameras, mostly uh, number uh, letter B is going to be the Microsense Red Edge. Uh, it is the most common one that I'm familiar with, uh, but there are other ones. Uh, these multi-spectral cameras see different wavelengths. And so we're used to seeing red, orange, yellow, you know, Roy G. Biv. It sees near infrared, infrared. Uh, and as we get in the hyperspectral, there are like 200 and some odd bands. Too much. That's why we use machine learning for those. Any questions or thoughts thus far? Okay, so how do we do all this stuff? Like, how do you how do you make this map so that you can determine uh, some of these nutrient deficiencies or where the fertilizer is? And so, uh, again, this is all GPS guided. Uh, we have an RTK system that is linked to the satellites and knows exactly where it is in the position. The drone is linked to the RTK and it takes a picture. And so, when I'm about to, one day, maybe Sunday, get out to fly this 300 acres. Uh, and I've done this at Oakley Farm. The drone takes a picture, right? And so it, it takes a picture straight down. And then as it moves, it takes another picture. But the pictures overlap. And so as it takes the picture forward, when it turns back around, now the pictures overlap to the side. So now you have like, four points of reference. So each picture is geo reference. So that's exactly where everything is in the picture. So now you have four pictures that are geo reference and it kind of shuffles them and makes one map as you can see on the screen. Um, not only does it measure like 2D, but it can make 3D models. And those 3D models like a 3D point cloud contains information about that exact point. So they use this in construction to determine if the building is like in the right place or uh, what kind of progress is being made. Just several applications for this, at least in the agriculture and the construction field. Since we take those pictures, uh, and if you have a, a, a multi-spectral camera with a high enough resolution, we can even see down to, uh, missing plants. So you use this for stand counts. If your planter messes up, you need to know where to go back and fix it. Why the drone? Say, you know what? We only need to go on this end of the field. It's the only place that it messed up. You don't have to travel and drive up and down looking for these skips. 
you can use the drone to take the pictures uh, to find the, the stand count. And so right here, you can see this is like 25, 23, 24, 28. We'll use this to determine how much yield is actually going. And guess what? Since we have precision ag, guess what? They're not going to put a, put a drop of nitrogen. Right there. <laughs> and believe it or not, those little bitty spaces add up. There's this, there's this old wise tale about the airline industry taking one olive out of every jar and saving a million dollars in olives. Doesn't seem like too much, but when you take one olive out of a million jars, it adds up. So not applying that fertilizer or going back and putting, you know, just a couple of seed there so that it grows, you know what your yield is going to be. Uh, everything changes because of those skips. Get back. That's going to suck. All right, so this is a map that I flew of Oakley Farm. And as I was making, uh, trying to put the other picture in there, it did not work. But I will try to show. Oh, take that back. I think it did work. This is going to be uh, just a regular map. This map is geo referenced. We now know what the acreage of that pond is. And if we know the area of the pond and the depth, then we can determine the volume. Uh, we can see that this is where our cattle travel. Something's going on here in this lake, right? With this little pond, that's probably not going well. Something is running off into that, or likely that is where the cattle are using as their toilet. They probably don't drink out of that one, though. Maybe. I don't know. No idea. All right. <laughs> but like we can we can start to see and we can know exactly what the area of this field is without having to walk that fence line. And if I zoomed in very uh, close, you could see me standing by my truck as I was flying this map. And this is just with a regular consumer type drone. I was flying at 400 feet and the camera is good enough that it can zoom all the way down and see that. Like the resolution is enough that I can zoom in. Uh, so we use this for soil and plant nutrient status, uh, specifically for the plant nutrients. And so that that camera, and not necessarily that one, but the multispectral camera uh, can see these different wavelengths. And so um, these wavelengths are reflected back off of the plant, and we can see the difference in whether this is a healthy crop, whether we need to apply... Seems to be backwards, isn't it? There we go. So we have a healthy crop. We apply less fertilizer or more water. Uh, but you probably couldn't tell that from looking at just at this picture. Everything looks fairly similar. Nothing looks bad. Uh, so the way that we can see those difference is by using this normalized difference vegetative index. And so uh, what color do plants absorb? Or what do they reflect? Green. So they absorb everything else except for the green, right? They reflect that back. Um, also, they, they will not, um, uh, they will absorb more near infrared. And that's where the multispectral comes in. So we really can't tell what color near infrared is because it's outside of the wavelengths that our eyes can detect. Uh, so the, the more, uh, the less red or the less near infrared that is reflected, the healthier the plant. And that's probably the long and the short of that. We notice over here that there is less near infrared being adsorbed. Oh no, this looks like it's reflecting. Um, and there's more red reflecting. And so uh, here we have uh, greater near infrared, less red light reflected, and we have a greater NDVI. So we know that the plant is healthy enough and we don't need to apply as much fertilizer. And so this is shown uh, by the red and the green spots or areas on this map. That's really...
So here we have a red spot. We probably need more fertilizer there. More fertilizer where it's red, less fertilizer where it's green. So here we are back to this map that I flew. I flew this with my regular personal drone. Um, again, we can see there are some areas that may or may not like to keep. I think if you could get real down into it, there might be a little bit of discoloration. You can see something right here as compared to the green right there. But it's difficult and you can't really tell. It looks okay. Now you can see a big difference, and now we can start to see where the cows actually travel. We can start to see that there's more nitrogen, and so we can start to see those differences, and we use this in order to determine where the problems are. So, super cool application, consumer drone, $1,500, and I was able to uh, determine a few things about this plant health. And so you monitor this over time, you've made the map, you fly it, and I flew this last August. Thing would be to go out and fly it next August, the August after that, and you can see your land use over time. You see those changes and you can monitor that. So that multi-spectral imaging can also be used to monitor nutrient, I mean, water status. Uh, we use it to identify weeds because weeds give off a different reflectance than, say, corn, especially at the small stages. A weed might grow up higher. You'd be able to tell that. Um, I'll go back with this, I can also do elevation. So the drone knows where it is in reference to the height and then also can tell how far it took that picture from and the changes in that. This is just a basic drone. Excuse me, if you had the multispectral, it would be almost, it, it would be very accurate. And so we can use that in order to determine biomass of a field, like a hay field. So how what, what is the plant height compared to the ground? So it measures from the ground because it knows how high it is and it knows it can, it can detect how high the, the forage mass is and detect the difference. And disease pressure as well. So all of these things combined are going to go into this decision support system. And so uh, this is where we start taking, uh, we start taking advantage of those uh, process based and machine learning models in order to give data driven solutions. So the goal is to test it versus what I would think would happen versus what the computer says would happen. I think many of us can agree that AI wins most of the time. Also, that as AI gets smarter, guess what it doesn't need? Human interaction. <laughs> so guess what's going to happen to the humans? We're not going to have a job because robots are going to take this over. They won't need us to uh, put some input in. It learns as we're learning, and it learns faster than we can and be able to determine those. So uh, I believe that there are some socioeconomical issues that will be facing us in the next 20 years as AI starts to take over. And guess what? There's a movie about that called iRobot. So you're going to say Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, maybe, yes. Or um, what was the other one with Shia LaBeouf, Eagle Eye, where it was oh, controlling yeah. the lights? Yeah. Do you think that AI could go too far? Too far? I've heard of like robots that actually come up with language and can communicate with one another. Like, that, like there were two that that actually happened with them. For now. We have For now. And pretty soon they'll, yeah, and then pretty soon they'll, they'll develop emotions. And again, it's iRobot all over again. Yeah. <laughs> so like, this is also a movie hour. We flash back in time. Uh, and so that ultimately leads to actionable decisions and we can measure that as an outcome. Um, just some information on these decision support systems and kind of what information goes into this. And this is all, this is agronomy. The information that is on this slide is all encompassing of agronomy. All of these components play a role in yield. And as an agronomist, I have to take all of those into consideration. Man, that's an awful lot. And for one person to have uh, that much responsibility uh, they would never be able to do this back in the day. 
as 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 we've advanced, uh, our technologies need to advance, and we need to get robots that can talk to themselves and figure this out. We're good. We're we're paying you just electricity. Uh, there are some other models that we use. The SALUS model uh, is more kind of the systems of this, and it takes into account photosynthesis and nutrient and water uh, and how those plants grow. So there are libraries that have this information. You can tweak one or the other and start to predict your yield. I'm not a machine learning person. I can at least know where, where is it at K nearest neighbor. K means. I think that's about as much as I know about machine learning models. K nearest neighbor forest randomized forest is that one as well? Exactly. So that's why, like, <laughs> at that point, I need someone who knows how to do models. I fly the drone. Okay, I'm the drone guy. <laughs> I don't need to understand models. I have a computer system that does that. And so there needs to be this collaboration with computer scientists and agronomists or environmental sciences. And the hard part is, is that I don't understand what they're talking about. I don't know what the data points are. And they're like, well, we don't know what data points you're going to give us. I don't know how many of those data points you need. You need it for every plant. How many plants do you need this to to train itself on? And then you have to test that again. Like so there's this thing where you're going to have to like try to understand what they're trying to understand about what your subject matter. Which finally brings us to this blockchain technology and as this data is created, you have to remember there's a GPS point for literally every nanosecond of every time like it exists just like the thing on a straight line like how many points are on a straight line an infinite all of them right <laughs> all of them and so this data can be recorded so we use machine learning to kind of sift through what is and isn't necessary but big data is an issue and it's only going to get bigger because now we're collecting more data and having to put that into the machine learning because the machine learning now needs something else to eat or play with as it's trying to figure this thing out. Which brings me to the end. Um, I'm working with a guy in uh, Arizona. We have come up with this kind of use case scenario for blockchain technology in agriculture systems and environmental sciences. So he's an environmental scientist in Arizona and he is doing. He basically goes out and makes sure that the gas stations are in compliance and then also does some uh, other environmental stuff and making sure that uh, those conservation practices are being met. So the problem with that is it does need to be incentivized. And so as we start telling producers to change into um, doing these uh, climate smart agriculture and start doing this conservation practices and soil health and carbon sequestration, how do you monitor that? How are you gonna tell a producer they need to monitor how much carbon dioxide they are or are not emitting? You just have to, you just have to monitor it, but getting them to let you monitor it is the future capital management. Well, it would be. Because they, how, they don't want you. They don't want you there, right? And they don't want to do it because then they don't want to know. It's yeah. kind of like checking your bank account. I don't like checking my bank account because I don't want to see how much money I spent. I don't want to see that I'm not meeting the standard. Um, how do you how do you really verify that someone sprayed less Roundup this year? How would you compare that? Yeah, you got to either trust them to just uh, tell you. And of course, they're going to lie because there's money involved. <laughs> That's why I work with animals. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, like, of course, they're going to, you know, like, keeping that data is a pain in the neck. Like, I got other things to be worried about other than monitoring Joe Bob, who's I'm paying $10 an hour to go spray weeds with, right? Like, driving a tractor or whatever. Uh, so, I believe that we can use this precision agriculture and the technology that we have for these monitors to uh, determine how much we actually apply. And we also want to minimize the application, so we don't want this big 60-foot boom sprayer going across the field for 17 weeks. So uh, we can use these sensors to monitor our fertilizer use. And remember that if we don't have a plant there, we can use that technology, and it doesn't apply that nitrogen. 
So less fertilizer use going to lead to some benefit economically, but also that we didn't apply as much. All right, this thing is super cool. I hope this plays. Come on. Quick little two minute video. Notice that it's just dropping the fertilizer where it needs to. So there's been some movement through the field or at least the sensor on the front of that rope, like see the sensor at the top? It is shooting X feet in front of it and recognizing where a weed is or isn't. That data is being processed instantly. And by the time that tractor gets or this little robot gets to that destination based on the GPS, it drops, a, it, it drops the exact amount of fertilizer necessary to kill that one plant. Compared to this. So not only is that economically advantageous, but also in, in this conservation practice. So this thing is obviously already on the market. Self driving tractor, automatic sprayer. Knows which knows the difference between the peppers and the weeds, and we're using machine learning and deep learning models to determine that. We have even library that knows the difference in the plants, allowing it to learn and improve as it operates. Of course, the pesticide industry is going to be upset about this. They're about to lose 90% of their profit. All right, cool. So here we have this thing, this, this robot that is traveling through the field that can de detect where the weed is. Thanks. Gotcha. Move forward. that all right cool so we have this now we have this robot that's running itself or this tractor that's driving itself that has a sensor on it that monitors the 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 output of, per, of herbicide so that's how we monitor on whether or not you actually decreased your use additionally <laughs> because that sensor picked that data up it knows next year where that weed should or should not be so now we can actually analyze on whether or not that particular herbicide was effective against mitigating weed pressure in your field. Man, that's super freaking awesome. Now I don't have to do this. And so now we have this one person that's monitoring their irrigation and their spraying uh, and their um, harvesting and all this other stuff. And it's being actually recorded on the blockchain. And once it's recorded on the blockchain, the blockchain is basically a group of servers in the computer uh, across the across the globe that all verify that this data exists. So it's very difficult to get into that blockchain and change the data at these different nodes. Right? It's just a, it's a it's a checks and balances to make sure that everything is still accurate. So we've got these sensors, uh, we've got the data collection, we got blockchain technology, and what I believe we can do, you write a smart contract that has these certain conservation criteria. You have to meet criteria one, two, three, and four. And when it is, you are issued a non fungible token. My NFT thing, but it does have application. And so uh, the problem is that we have anonymity. And we don't want that data to be known that it's that person. So, how many baseball players have we had throughout time? And you, do, you can do that by state. Let's say you live in. Missouri, and you're a Kansas City Royals fan, you sign up for the Kansas City Royals NFT collection, and every NFT, every baseball card, or every baseball player that ever played for the Kansas City Royals, that can be your identifier, and that's the NFT that you get delivered. So that when each one of these smart contracts is uh, these 
conservation practices is met, you get issued an NFT. So you do that over four years. You got NFT one uh, that measured that you decreased your um, herbicide use and your fertilizer. You get NFT two, three, and four. And that when you collect all four NFTs that you've met all the conditions of the smart contract, that money is instantly sent to your wallet or bank account. So now there's not this, well, we have to come audit your records. And you got all these books that you have to put on the table and let the NRCS person come through. It takes them forever. And then they're going to find some discrepancy because that's their job is to not pay you. But you did everything you were supposed to do. Now it's, it's documented. And they can't, and now they don't have to. So once that smart contract is met, boom, the money gets deposited in your account. And that's how we can incentivize that and make it not a hassle for both parties. I believe this thing is going to be huge for the future workforce because they're fiercely independent, even though they don't really know what they're doing. They want to do it, but they don't know how to do it. They also don't want to actually do the work, so they'll find the easier, softer way. And they're technologically challenged. The number one thing I hear from students tell me is that they're not good at math and they're not good with technology. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? Like, do you understand that's what we do? is technology and math. You got to add your money up. So I believe this is going to be a challenge. And when I gave this presentation uh, previously, I went through that like we need to start at the at the elementary level and get them at least learning what coding can do. And then as you move up into middle school, you increase the level and now they're dealing with greenhouses through a VR headset. And then as they get to be high school, we're preparing them to come to college where we're going to teach them the how to operate the robot that's spraying the fertilizer or spraying the um, herbicide. So this is my job. My job is to make sure that the person who leaves as an agronomist uh, has an understanding of these technologies at bare minimum, because if you don't understand the technology, then it's pointless. So trying to teach them the technology first, but then also that they need to understand some of the back story the, the the fundamentals of agricultural production is important as well. But like, they need to be knowing the technology more than they need to be knowing the backstory. We can Google that. You can ask grandpa, he'll tell you the backstory, but you're gonna need an hour or two. And again, cannot hire people and tell them what to do from two standpoints. Number one, we hired you, you should know. That's my biggest one is like, I don't want to send students out that don't know, that have to be told what to do and have their hand held because they don't know and they get to their job and they made it through Tennessee Tech and they've got their degree and then they go, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, Why do we hire you then? <laughs> and then also we would hope that they're smart enough that someone would go, you know what? You are way smarter than me at machine learning and K nearest neighbor and randomized forest and I'm just going to let you handle that business and trust that you know what you're doing. And just that I know what I'm doing. And so that is all I have for that. About an hour. All right, cool. Is that uh, so the statistic you just put up there that said there were 60,000 jobs in agriculture and only 30,000 students? Uh, does that account for this kind of like increase in technology? Right? Because like what you're pitching is a a decrease in actual like workers out there, right? You're like it's one person running a thing. So does that? No, that is saying that we need sixty thousand one person okay. one man shows. Okay. And there's only thirty five thousand coming. Okay. Yeah. That's like the job demand is greater than what we can provide. We're only graduating thirty five thousand students. We need to be graduating sixty. So in, in like smart ag. Kind of yeah, stuff. just in agriculture itself. I believe that was um, Tom Vilsack. It was either Tom Vilsack or Charlie Hatcher said that. Uh, Tom Womack. Tom Womack said that at, at FFA last year. When I went to the FFA convention last year, that was the statistic that he threw out to his young, to high school FFA was that we need, we have 60,000 jobs available and only 35,000 people to fill them. So what, where are the opportunities for a lot of these um, 
precision ag and data science roles, uh, applied data science roles in agronomy um, for somebody who is uh, recently finding interest in agronomy, for example? Um, if you know how to do all the other stuff that's not agronomy, I can teach you the agronomy. Like we can learn how that goes. So the agronomy isn't the isn't the key anymore. It's being able to do the data analysis. It's being able to to understand K nearest neighbor. I can teach the agronomy probably easier than you could teach me K nearest neighbor and all the intricacies that go <laughs> on with that. So you'll be using your data science and agronomy being the canvas. And as you play with it, Mo, you'll understand and go, oh, you know what, if I do this, then that. And so I believe that there's definitely opportunities uh, for people who are data scientists that can understand what the inputs are rather than it would be for an agronomist who is just used to boots on the ground walking through the field. You know, I mean, you've seen the pictures. It's two guys standing in the field smiling at a leaf. They don't know how to do the technology, right? They know how to stand in the field and go, oh, look, army worm, we need to spray. <laughs> Go get the big boom sprayer. Get the 80 nozzle boom sprayer. Put a whole bunch in it. Put a couple of glugs in it. Let's go. So I believe that the data science is it would probably be easier to hire than it would be your traditional agronomist without any technology knowledge. Great. Thank you. One question I had for you, especially with the drones. So do map projections cause any problems with that, or is everything just pretty much the WGS-84 across the worldwide data? So you can change the map projection depending on which one you want. And so depending, like it takes a TIFF, when it takes a TIFF file, and when you overlay that onto whatever map projection, the computer software adjusts that. But it typically is WGS-84. Okay. I, I was just kind of wondering if that would cause the drone. Be a little bit off if it's target, say a week, something like that. Or... The drone is just taking the picture. Oh, okay. okay. That's all it is doing and geo referencing it. Right. That's it. Okay. And so and you would you think that, project. and then you would project from there, right? Because it would be much easier to that than typing in WGS 84 yeah. and then someone else uses a different map projection. And you go, how come this doesn't line up? And you go, oh, you weren't using WGS 84. So that everyone can have access to that one picture and use whatever map projection they prefer. Another question I had: I took remote sensing back in the day. Got the talk kind of. I feel like his information may have been a little. There's distortion on the outer edges of the. Mm -hmm. Is that still an issue that you guys are encountering? That that's why we have the overlap. Gotcha. Right, so it would take the best part of it. It's no different than uh, doing Photoshop. Right, so that you know, sometimes when I take regular pictures, I take three: one that's at um, the right exposure, one a little less, and one a little darker. And then all three of those come out, and it pulls the best part of that. Like our software is good enough to know what the best pixel to pull out of that is. And so there can be some distortion on the edge of that camera, um, especially like in a consumer drone. But because it overlaps, the best pixel will come to the top. So it kind of layers that together. And whichever the best pixel is it comes out and that distortion is accounted for. Uh, most of them are getting really good at being able to account for that. You also tell, um, I use drone deploy. You also tell drone deploy what drone you're flying. It knows the it knows what camera is on there and it knows the distortions that might exist. And so it kind of takes care of that. I just use that because it's easy. I can make a free trial with, I just make a million and one G Gmail accounts and I get 14 days free. I can go fly. When I go fly this 300 acres, I'm going to make all good aerial at the, you know, 32 at gmail.com. And then two weeks from now, I'll make it 33 and then 34 and then 35 until one day I get enough money to just buy the $1,500 a year subscription. Maybe it's more like 3,000. I don't know. It'll be a lot. It's easier for me to just make an email. <laughs> Fly this one property that I have, make the money off of that. Keep on trucking. Uh, but those softwares know what camera you're using, and they've accounted for that in their research and development at, let's say, Parrot or Sequoia um, or 
um, Micah Sings. Okay. Yeah, because I mean they they want to have this very accurate map. They don't want to see that looks like an eraser got it right, or like the water dropped on it. So uh, we're trying to get as precise as we can and have the best resolution, the best imagery, uh, so that we can't use. Well, it was distorted. There's a reason why it didn't work. Anyone else? Uh, just a quick comment for anybody who might be scared about the uh, looming future of AI and everything. Uh, um, the the iRobot scenario and really the whole the AI takeover is uh, largely a fear created by um, Hollywood. And as as magical as AI does seem at times, um, most AIs are inherently really simple and really stupid in the sense that they can only really do one task and do that one task really well. The real magic behind it is the uh, the consistency and the um, methodological approach of tweaking um, that system when it doesn't work and how to make it better over time. So uh, fear not. You're, you're you know, we're we're not going to be uh, living in a Skynet situation. Um, it's just a, <laughs> yeah. So, I think it was just that everyone is at least old enough to remember Terminator. Sometimes, sometimes when I throw some movie references out there in class, it goes over like a lead balloon. Not one face changes, and I go, "Oh, y'all aren't old enough to remember that." <laughs> you stand up there and go, "Bueller," Bueller, and they're like, "Who?" Never mind. Got a whole presentation. So I do have to be aware that this generation doesn't have the movie depth that I do. Uh, but when I get to talk with older students, I get the opportunity to kind of bring those up to the surface and we can all get a laugh out of that and go, who remembers this movie? And, you know, uh, Inspector Gadget and kind of things like that, because kids probably wouldn't remember Inspector Gadget and they've, they've known smartwatches their whole life. So it's not novel for them. They're like, oh, it's just a watch. No, <laughs> you understand? It's an Inspector Gadget. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that is all that we have. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present this. And um, I hope there was at least uh, some thought provoking going, oh, five years from now, when you see this happening, remember that you heard this from Dr. Naturist. I'm not rich, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, and just a couple of things that I, you know, I kind of look forward to, and and as I'm in my NFT kind of Web three movement, um, if you want to understand a little bit about Web three, look up Mark Zuckerberg's video about Meta, the Metaverse. Um, interesting concepts. So, all right. One more thing to add. Oh. So we are getting a paper later today. Yep. And um, I'll go ahead and post that online. Is Thursday still okay with everyone to talk about it? Good. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Like that, don't need to have anything. <laughs> uh.